Lord. As they're heading out the door, um, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We're continuing our series through Hebrews. We're going through it verse by verse. Um, my plan was to get through 4 through 7 today, but I'll go ahead and give you a, a disclaimer that I probably will not get through verse 7. Um, so we're going to get as far as we can, and the good thing about expository preaching is we'll just pick up wherever we leave off. But today I want to talk about the faith on the, faith on the road set before us. Um, again, I think as we think of our nation, as we think of the challenges ahead of us and the challenge for the church, there's a lot of similarities to what these believers were going through. We believe they were Jewish believers. Uh, they were probably, this letter was probably written around the early 60s. Uh, Nero is in power. As these believers look towards the future, they are not too encouraged because Nero has possibly already began persecution of the church, or at least that's on the horizon, and many of them are uncertain where the path is going to lead. And so many of them apparently, or they're being tempted to go back into Judaism. They've come out of Judaism, they've trusted Christ, or they have professed Christ, and now many of them are being tempted to go back mainly for safety because Judaism was not the target of Nero's persecution. They was aimed at Christians. And so they're being challenged and tempted to go back into what they consider safe. And the writer of Hebrews is telling them, do you understand who Jesus is? <laughs> know his identity because he is better and there is nothing that you can go back to. There is uh, nothing that has, everything is pointing towards him because he is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. Uh, he's better than Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. And so be understanding his identity and knowing who he is then, at the end of the book, gives us that endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And so again, if I could picture it this way, uh, life only moves in one direction. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it moves in one direction. Sometimes we think, man, I wish I could go back. Times were so much easier back then. I'd love to go back then. But God doesn't give us that option. Uh, the life moves in one direction. As we look ahead, we see this un cloud of uncertainty. We don't know what's in store, but we recognize the realities of life, sickness, aging, pain, suffering, conflicts, persecution, disaster, and death. Not necessarily the, the cloud of uncertainty that we would want to head into. So what in the world gives us stability? Well, Hebrews 11 begins with, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance. A Greek word, hypostasis, hypo meaning under, stasis, standing. It is the undergirding. Uh, it is what stabilizes you. It's your foundation. It what comes underneath you and in an uncertain world gives you some certainty, gives you stability. And it's also the evidence of things not seen. We have a hope that transcends this life. We have a hope of what Christ, that Christ is coming back and he is going to reign. And faith becomes the eyes that see um, we walk by faith and not by sight. That sight there is physical sight. We don't look at the world around us. We look beyond and we see the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Verse 2, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Uh, those in the past were, bore witness. God bore witness to them by their faith. God is looking at our faith. He wants us to trust him. And you can guarantee that if he is looking to develop our faith, he's going to put us in situations where our faith is going to be tested. And we have to learn on that path to trust him. And then in verse 3, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So what's undergirding that faith? It's faith in the character of God. It's faith in the word of God. It's the word of God that becomes that foundation um, we look in verse 3, and he says, don't you understand that everything that you see around us, look around you, all of this was created by the power of God's word, and it's sustained by the power of God's word. Uh, we look in verse 3, and the things which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. This is written 2,000 years ago. That would be totally countercultural to everything that they understood. The Greeks and the Romans believed that matter was eternal, uh, that there's always been something. In fact, that was the predominant view even in science up until about 1960. Uh, the, the theory was a steady state theory. There's always been matter. Matter is eternal. It wasn't until the early 60s that the concept of a Big Bang, this, the fact that, and whatever you think about the Big Bang, just understand this. What it says is there was absolutely nothing. Nothing. Can you wrap your minds around nothing? Nothing. We can't even picture nothing because we picture air even in the nothing. But there's no even air. There's nothing. 
and then suddenly there was a burst of light, and this came into creation. Um, that goes beyond what science can do, because they can't put that in a lab and make nothing suddenly become something. And not only that, but they understand at that beginning, that moment, that the only way they can describe that energy as powerful light, that it was powerful light that emerged at that time, and that everything you see in matter is really that energy. Uh, like I said last week, we're mostly empty space, and the things you touch are empty space. Doesn't that sort of freak you out a little bit? Um, your body is mostly empty space, held together by energy. They say if you reduced all of the empty space out of every human being on the earth, 7 billion of us, we would all fit in a sugar cube. That's how much empty space we are. What is holding us together? Science says energy or strong nuclear forces. What is that? They don't know. Why is it even doing it? Touch yourself. You are being held together right now by the power of of God's word right now. Colossians 1, in him all things are held together. Hebrews 1, he upholds all things by the power of his word, the dunamis, the dynamite, the active power of his word, his rhema, his spoken word. Everything you see is held together by the dynamic power of God's word. Your very body right now as we speak, scientifically, is being held together by an energy they can't explain, but the Word of God says it's dynamic power of the Word of God holding you together physically right now. And what Hebrews is saying is understanding that God's Word is what framed and is holding together this universe physically. Let it hold you together emotionally. Let it hold you together spiritually. It's already holding you together. If it wasn't holding you together, you'd be flying around in space like everything else in chaos. It's holding this universe together. It's the word of God that gives us faith in God and that response of trust because he's the one that holds everything together. In him, we live and move and have our very being. Therefore, we have a foundation. We don't look at the circumstance around us. Uh, we look at the promise and the reality of God's word. Now he's going to give us some examples. Verse 4. He's going to start, and we all know that Hebrews 11, this great hall of faith, all these examples. And don't we need examples Sounds great, you know, let's walk by faith, but we need examples. We need living examples around us. We need examples that have gone before us, that cloud of witnesses. And he's going to give us a bunch of examples. The reason I call this faith on the road set before us is because as you look at these different people, you're going to see that faith works its way out in their lives in different ways. Each one is a unique story, and faith works its way out in a unique way in each of their lives. It's not going to be the same. It's not cookie cutter. By faith they did this, and by faith they did this, and it's all the same. No, by faith, each life is very different. And I believe that when it says, uh, let us run with endurance, the race, that's definite, that lies before us, that's an interesting Greek word. It means it's set before us. It could also be appointed for us. Now, that could be corporate, because that church is about to go through a race or a race course that's been lied bef uh, it's laying before them. But I think you can individualize it. Each of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. You recognize that? Look around you. Everybody's different. Um, we're so unique that our, the ridges on our thumbs are so unique that they can identify you based on the ridges on your thumbs. Not only that, uh, your tongue prints are so unique that they can identify you from your tongue print. Your iris is unique. The retina, if they were to go inside and see your nervous system, it's totally uh, unique. They even say the shape of your ear is unique. Uh, they're developing a smartphone, and as soon as you put it up against your ear, it recognizes you because of the shape of your ear and immediately opens because your ear is totally unique. The way you walk is unique. They've discovered that everybody walks in a slightly different way. They've even discovered that your body odor is unique. Um, and you may say, yeah, I've noticed that about other people. <laughs> but um, that you can't even cover it up. Even what you eat and what you put on does not hide what they could essentially say is a unique odor. So everything that God has done, he, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He has crafted us in a unique way. Wouldn't it make sense that if he's crafted you in a unique way, that he has laid a road before you that is very unique to you? Now, sometimes we want to do someone else's road. We like their road better. It looks better. And what he's saying is, no, you run with endurance the race course that is appointed, that is set before you, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Because if the one who crafted you uniquely, 
uh, he's crafted you in that way. He's also crafted you and equipped you to run the race that he has lied, that he lays before you. And you have to trust him. Each of these people we're going to see had a unique race course ahead of them, but they trusted God in the midst of it. Let's start off with Abel, verse 4. He's going to go back to Genesis chapter 4. And let's look at the faith of Abel. How did faith work its way out in the life of Abel? Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, probably being through his faith, he being dead still speaks. Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, put a thumb there. Put your outline somewhere in Hebrews 11. Let's venture back to Genesis chapter 4, and let's get a little bit of background. Again, remember God creates the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3, mankind falls, Adam sins, uh, Eve sins, she's deceived, and she sins, and the earth is thrust into um, the bondage of sin. The earth itself is cursed. Man experiences separation from God. But God, in the midst of that, promises a deliverer that at some point the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. And as we get to chapter 4, here's what happens. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Cain means acquired. And she said, I have gotten a man or acquired a man from the Lord. Let me just stop there. There's a lot of different ways you can approach this, but a lot of people think that she believed that Cain was that deliverer. <laughs> God had promised that a seed of a woman would crush the serpent's head. There's some indications here that she may have thought that Cain was that deliverer. Uh, first of all, she doesn't say, I have a baby. She's like, I got a man, uh, a deliverer. And it is interesting that in the uh, Hebrew, you could translate it, I have gotten a man, the Lord, uh, picturing him as a deliverer uh, from the Lord. We don't know for sure, but certainly uh, his life does not turn out to be much of a deliverer. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, a shepherd, but Cain was a tiller of the ground, a farmer. And in the process of time, probably hundreds of years, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Why did he bring an offering? We don't quite know, but we can only assume that Adam had taught them of the importance of offering to give God his glory and his honor. Uh, Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of, the flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Hebrews said... Abel offered a better sacrifice. There's a lot of different uh, theories or ideas on what exactly made it a better sacrifice. I think the first thing was it was a blood sacrifice. Um, he brought a lamb. He brought the firstborn lamb. He brought it to the Lord, and he sacrificed it. Now, the fact that Cain brought fruit or produce, does that make his automatically disqualified? No, because there were many offerings that were just a meal offering to the Lord. But it is in interesting that he brings a lamb. And that certainly has to be an echo to a future lamb that would come. And he seemed to understand that my sin needs a substitute as he makes that sacrifice to the Lord. It was a blood sacrifice. It was a better sacrifice. It was a best sacrifice. Notice Cain just brought an offering. It just is a indescript. He brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. Whereas Abel, it makes sure you understand, this was the firstlings of his flock and of their fat possibly could be translated the fattest of the firstlings of his flock. He looked at his flock, he found the best, and that's what he offered to the Lord. Uh, Cain was just going through the motions of religious duty. Abel saw this as a way to honor and to worship the Lord with the best that he could offer. And I would say, ultimately, it was a faith sacrifice. Abel did that as an expression of his trust and relationship to God. Notice that the text says that... Uh, God did not, God respected Abel, so him first, and, and his offering, and he did not respect Cain and his offering. The emphasis is on the condition of their heart as he lists the person before the offering. So what happened to Cain? Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Uh, his countenance showed a sadness, uh, an, uh, an anger upon it. As those two often go together, that Depression behind depression oftentimes is an anger and a life is not going the way I want it to. And that was what was the case with him. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. It's crouching at the door and its desire, its hunger is for you, but you should rule over it. 
He recognized something was wrong with Cain's heart, and he spoke as a loving father, saying, do you understand that sin is crouching at the door, and right now it, its desire is to destroy you? Uh, we play around with sin because we don't understand that sin always enslaves us. Sin always leads to a bondage. Sin always leads to an addiction. Sin always has a desire to blind us to God's truth and then eventually destroy us. That's what sin does. We play around with it. We diminish it. But God warned him, this is what's going to happen if you do not turn to me and turn away from this sin. So Cain heard God's word. He heard God's loving warning. What does he do? He does not listen to it because it's not mixed with faith. And so what happens? Cain talked with Abel, his brother, saying, let's go out to the field. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Let me stop there. Let me read what one Jewish commentator said about this passage. He said, in the famous Am I My Brother's Keeper sequence, the book of Genesis records God confronting murderer Cain. Your brother's bloods cry out to me from the ground. Bloods is in the plural in Hebrew. Apparently, Cain didn't know how to kill Abel and so had to beat him repeatedly. There were many wounds. As Abel's life ebbed blow upon blow, he must have called to God for help. But no help came, though God had just accepted Abel's offering. By the fourth chapter of Genesis, Abel, the righteous one, is dead. (laughs) I had a quote here on the back of your outline. Death did not first strike Adam, the first sinful man, nor Cain, the first murderer, but Abel, the innocent and the righteous. You catch that? The first one that's identified as pleasing God, as having an offering that pleases God, and being a person who is righteous in his sight is the first person that's killed. The world has been turned upside down in Genesis 3, and you see it immediately in Genesis 4. So what did faith look like for Abel? Well, I think uh, faith looks like this in a life like Abel's. Faith may call us to trust God on a road marked with suffering and early death. Those are difficult paths, but it was the path that was laid out before Abel, and he walked by faith. He probably did not fully understand, but he trusted the author of the story. And the first person who's identified as a righteous one in Genesis is the one that suffers an early death. Sometimes the road of faith calls us to trust him even when we don't understand the suffering and the death. I thought of five missionaries on January 8, 1956. There were five missionaries that went to Ecuador. They were going to try to reach the Aka tribe, the Weodoni. Um, it was a very violent tribe, a tribe that was known to have killed many different people, and they had a heart to share the gospel with them. Uh, Roger Udarian, Pete Fleming, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Egg McCauley, all of them in their 20s. Um, I think all of them were married. They went down into Ecuador, and they tried to establish some contact and thought they had good contact. And on January 8, 1956, They flew into that remote area of Ecuador. They landed. Uh, They thought that they were going to start having a friendly um, conversation and interaction with the people there. And the next thing you know, 20 warriors come out and spear them to death. It was covered all over the news here in America. It was a feature in Life magazine. All five of them had guns. And none of them pulled it to shoot. Because they knew that these were people they were trying to reach with the gospel and they literally chose to be martyrs instead of harming the people that were coming to kill them. Jim Elliott had made a statement in one of his, in his diary where he said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep his life to gain that which he cannot lose. And he was one of those ones that gave up his life early. And many people would say, well, wasn't that a waste of his life? Why would God lay that kind of path in front of him? Well, if you notice back in Hebrews 11, it says even though Abel died early, his faith still speaks. We're still talking about it today. (laughs) And guess what? I'm talking about the lives of these five people because their faith still speaks uh, today. It's interesting that uh, Rachel Saint, who was Nate Saint's sister, went into that tribe after her brother was killed. And Elizabeth Elliot, who was also in her 20s, went into that tribe after her husband was killed. And they began to share the gospel. And eventually, members of that tribe began to trust Christ. So that today, 40% of the tribe know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on top of that, you have um, 
Nate Saint's two children, Kathy and Steve, who started to live among that tribe. And when they came to the point where they wanted to proclaim and profess their faith in Jesus Christ and get baptized, guess who baptized them? (laughs) Some of the warriors that killed their dad baptized them in the very river where his blood was dispersed as he was killed. It doesn't make sense as we see it from a very small sliver, but from God's, the author of the story, their faith still speaks to us today. I think of my sister Jill, uh, who died at age 36, had two young children at the time. Her husband was a pastor. She was, I would say, the, the most gentle and most godly woman I knew growing up. And at age 36, she dies of cancer. And you think, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God do that? Why would God lay that road in front of anybody? Must be a mistake. No. The life of Abel tells us that sometimes the path laid ahead of us is a path we walk by faith, and sometimes it requires a suffering or an early or tragic death. But that faith speaks. It was her faith that led my father to Jesus Christ. Every time I see my dad reading his scriptures, every time I hear about my dad sharing the gospel with someone who needs to know Christ, It's her faith that's speaking through him. We don't know the road that's lying ahead of us, but we trust the author of that road, even when it requires a life like Abel's. But he doesn't end there. We've heard about Abel. Let's look at Enoch. What do we know about the faith of Enoch? Well, verse 5, it's almost like a direct opposite story. By faith, Enoch was translated so he did not see death. One died early, a very brutal death, One doesn't even see death, and he was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We'll go back to Genesis. You don't have to flip back there. It's only uh, four verses, so why don't we just read it here on the screen. It says this, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, back then they lived a little longer, obviously. Not many people have a child at 65, but that was pretty normal back then. Um, After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years. And had sons and daughters, so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. How many of y'all have walked with the Lord for 300 years? Not many of us. We don't know exactly what he was doing before, but Scripture seems to indicate that he was not much of a God follower. And then he had Methuselah, and something changed. Maybe being a father kicked in, and he suddenly realized the responsibility he had. But something kicked in, and he began to walk with God for 300 years, and he got so close to God that apparently at some point God said, well, there's nothing else for you to learn. Why don't you come on home? I think that's what Paul was saying in Philippians 3 when he says, I am pursuing Christ with such intensity that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. What's he talking about? I think he's saying, I'm pursuing Christ with so much passion, I want to get to the point where I've reached the end of the race course that God appointed for me, and he says, come on home. There ain't nothing, not anything else to learn. Enoch reached that point, and he was translated right into the presence of God. I love that word, translated. Isn't that a cool word? Uh, He was in this language or in this world, and the next thing you know, he was in this language, and he was in that world. If I had to choose which road, the road of Abel or the road of Enoch, I'm, I'm, I'm good with the road to Enoch. I like that one. In fact, I'm looking for the day when God raptures us and takes us home. Uh, It could happen any moment. It's the imminency of the Return of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I'm going to tell you a mystery, something that wasn't revealed before. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. But we're all, who are believers, are going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, because the trumpet's going to sound, and the dead are going to be raised incorruptible, and we're all going to be changed. Because this corruptible must put on incorruption. It can't inherit heaven like this. And this mortal body must inherit immortality. And when this corruptible inherits incorruption, and when this mortal inherits immortality, then will come true the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Hoo-hoo. I hate death. It's an enemy. It's the last enemy that's going to be destroyed. And then he says, death, where's your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Because the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have no other hope apart from the resurrection and the life of Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, 
Always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor for the Lord is not in vain. No matter what path he's laid before you, if you walk with God and you trust him along the way, you can be guaranteed that your life is going to make an impact in this world because you're going to accomplish the workmanship that God established you to accomplish. You are part of his poem, and he has written you into his poetry, and you will fulfill that role that he has appointed for you as you walk with him. I love that word walk as well. He walked with God. Uh, I like what Steve Cole says, a walk is not spectacular or impressive. It's not the flashiest, flashiest or quickest way to get someplace, but it's a frequent description of the Christian life. We're told to walk by faith and not by sight. We're told to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're told to walk in love and to walk in the light as he is in the light. Walking, to walk with God means our lives are in step with God, yield in obedience to him, heading in the direction he chooses. Walking also implies intimacy and fellowship. Uh, one of the things I enjoy with my wife is we go walking pretty often in the morning. We wake up, and if it's not too humid and, and hot outside, we'll go for a walk together. What does it mean to walk together? Well, it means we're heading the same direction. It uh, means we're on the same road together, and we walk at the same pace. Uh, I don't get too far ahead of her, and, and if she's lagging behind, I, I don't race ahead, and we stay at the same pace. We start to match our stride together because we're walking together, and we're talking about the day, and we're making plans uh, for what the day holds. And so we're sharing our lives and we're sharing our hearts together as we walk. And that's the picture of what God calls you to do. Don't overcomplicate the Christian life. He invites you to walk with him every day. You wake up and you give him the first fruits of your day and you walk with him. And you just share intimacy with him and you walk in the spirit and you keep in step with the spirit day by day. Now, walking with my wife is a lot different than walking my dog. I walk my dog every morning, too. Little shadow. I take her out, and I walk her every morning. But before I go out the door, I put a leash on her because she's not interested in intimacy and fellowship with me as we walk. <laughs> as soon as the door opens and she looks at the grand world of smells around her, her nose immediately is looking for food. Uh, cat poop is on the top of her list. <laughs> And so as we go walking, it's a totally different experience because we're not keeping the same pace. Sometimes she's pulling me ahead because she smells something and she wants to get her mouth on it. Sometimes she smells something dead in the back of the road and I'm ready to go and I have to pull her and bring her along because her desires on that trip are totally different than my desires. She's not walking in fellowship with me. She's walking and seeking something else. And I sometimes wonder how many believers are not walking with God, but we're the same way. We are going after the things that this world offers, and we're not seeking God. We're wondering why he's not blessing us or why life isn't going the right way, but we are pulling and tugging and going every different direction. Notice what it says in verse 6 after about walking with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Seek him out. I like what one person said, a buzzard seeks dead things. And a hummingbird seeks sweet things. What we find in life is sometimes a telling testimony of what we're looking for. Are you angry all the time? Cynical? Or what are you searching out? What are you feeding your mind? Are you growing in intimacy with the Lord? Are you experiencing a, a daily intimacy with Him? Well, my guess is you're seeking Him out. And I do think you can look at the first fruits of your day and probably figure out what you're seeking in this life. If the first fruits of your day are not focused on the Lord and saying, God, I want to walk with you today, then I would encourage you to look at your life and say, what am I seeking? And what is at the forefront of my mind as I begin each day? Walking with God. And so what does that mean? Faith may call us to walk with God faithfully over the long haul of life. <laughs> the road before us may take us quickly, and we have to trust God even we don't understand, even if we're the family and friends that do not understand, we trust him. And faith may call us to walk with God faithfully over the long haul of life, as we see with Enoch. In fact, as I thought of that, I thought of Billy Graham. He's going to be 99 this year. <laughs> and I think he's one, I think, is a modern example of someone who's walked faithfully with the Lord over the long haul of life. He says this in his uh, book, Nearing Home, I never thought I would live to be this old. All my life I was taught how to die as a Christian, but no one ever taught me how to, how to live in the years before I die. I wish they had because I'm an old man now, and believe me, it's not easy. <laughs> Imagine a man who has that passion to share the gospel around the world. He's probably got like a pioneering spirit like Paul, 
and God brings him to a place where he cannot do anything physically, and he simply has to walk with God day by day and trust him. I don't know the path that he's put before you, but whatever the path is, our calling is to walk with him and trust him. I was supposed to get to Noah, but we're not going to get to Noah. Um, Here's the slide so you can get excited about next week or two weeks from now as uh, we get to there. Um, But I want to get to this point, uh, trusting the author. I don't know the road God has for you. I don't know what lies before you. Uh, If you're like me and like most of us, we probably don't like it at times. Uh, We look back in our past. We can't understand why God would allow certain things to happen. We look in our present. We don't like the present circumstances we're in. We look towards the future. We're not sure. We like the road that it seems like we're headed on. But in all of that, you trust the author. Um, One of my favorite stories is John 21. uh, Christ has risen from the dead. He's interacting with Peter, and he begins to tell Peter what his plan is for Peter's life. And he basically says, they're going to take you where you don't want to go, and they're going to do things to you that you don't want them to do. And Peter immediately hearing this from the Lord saying, I'm not sure I like this kind of uh, future plan. And he turns to John, the disciple John, and he says, well, what about him? What's your road for him? And you might remember what he told Peter. Basically said, that's none of your business. If I will for him to be alive when I come back 2,000 years later, it's none of your business. You follow me. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Corporately, I don't know what's in store with this nation, but let's walk with him. Individually, I don't know what he has in store for you, Um, but let's walk with him. Now, this is a promise in Jeremiah 29 and 11. Everybody, I I love it. I think a lot of people love it. It I'll be contextually, it's a promise given to the nation of Israel as they are in bondage in Babylon. And that's the immediate context. But I think you can apply it. Because if you understand, when Israel's in Babylon, they said, I don't understand how God could do this. How in the world can God take his chosen people, people he's promised, we're going to inherit the land and put them in the land of idolatry, under slavery and bondage, to a people of of idolaters? It didn't make any sense. In the midst of captivity, he said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. The most any of us ever see of this story is just a sliver. And God, who's the author and the, the oh, Alpha and Omega, the author and finisher of our faith, he sees the beginning and the end through all, all eternity. And he says, you may not understand the particular chapter that you're in, but trust me because I wrote the story. And you can have confidence that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, how do we know? How can we trust the author? Because the author wrote himself into the story. <laughs> And he didn't write himself into a story where he became a a king and was born into a palace. He wrote himself into the story being born in a stable as a servant, as the Lamb of God, who came and demonstrated God's love and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And so it's communion that reminds us that the author who wrote the story wrote himself into the story and he took our place, the perfect representative of God, the perfect representative of us, shed his blood Because he was man, his blood can be a vicarious substitute. Because he is God, it has infinite, eternal value. And it can cover the sins of anyone who comes to him in faith. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, I invite you to trust him because you have no other hope outside of him. He is the resurrection and he is the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. I encourage you to trust him and embrace him as your Savior. And then you can celebrate this and understand what it means. If you're a believer, as you celebrate this, remember the love of God and trust him no matter what road he lies before you and walk with him day to day, uh, growing in intimacy with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Father, we we thank you that you are sovereign. We don't always understand the road ahead of us, but we can trust you. Father, I know there's some people here who are thinking, I wish I was on any other road than the one I'm on. But, Father, I pray that you would encourage them, and by faith, they would walk with you, seeing things differently because of the hope they have in Christ. If someone here has never trusted Christ as their Savior, I pray right now they would understand their need for a Savior, that they have no hope, they have no solution for sin or for death, and that right now they would recognize that you died on the cross for them, that you rose again, and that, Father, you offer the free gift of salvation to anyone who would receive it. And I pray that they would receive it now, that they would believe in their heart that you rose from the dead, believe in their heart that you died for them, 
and that they would confess that to others so that we can help them to grow in their faith. Father, we thank you for communion. It reminds us of your love, and may we celebrate that love as we uh, celebrate it together. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.